Right down on the very tip of England at St Ives in Cornwall, where the Atlantic rollers freewheel in across the bay at the end of their long journey, is tucked away one of those small specialist museums that are so rewarding to visit. You'll find it in Fore Street, which is what the Cornish always seem to call their high streets, rather modestly wedged in amongst the gift shops and the ice cream parlours. The Barnes Museum of Cinematography is devoted to a collection of all the fascinating and myriad devices which have been developed through the ages to achieve the magic of reproducing movement in two dimensions and making pictures come alive. It's privately owned and its proprietor and curator is John Barnes. Well, after that rather spectacular entrance, before we look around the museum, you must tell us the significance of the Victorian topless lady there. Well, these are some of the photographs taken by Edward Mybridge, who started in 1872 an electrophotographic investigation into animal locomotion. He had a series of cameras, a whole battery of cameras, and let the shutters off one after the other so that he got a sequence of movement. The classic case is the galloping horse. Um, he proved that a horse has all its four legs off the ground during at one stage of the gallop, which was known before. I see. Mm. Can we have a look around the rest of the yes, museum? Yes, certainly. Now, John, I see this first display is called shadowgraphy. What's that doing in a cinema museum? Well, one can think of the shadow show as the first form of moving picture on a screen. This puppet here, for instance, it's you, when you see it projected on a screen, that's the shadow of it. It's a two-dimensional moving picture. This is a Javanese puppet cut out of buffalo hide, and the shadow show itself dates from about the 10th century. This silhouette here, John, what, what's the history behind that? Well, it's a figure used for the shadow show. It's Indian, but it's it's not a traditional Indian figure which were made of leather. This has an influence of the British Raj, as you can see. It's articulated in all the joints, so when you pull the wires, the figure moves. Now this looks interesting, John. A large wooden box. It looks a bit like a castle. Brickwork painted on it. What is it? It's a magnificent peep show from Germany, about 1735. When you look through the peephole, inside were various scenes. It was very popular in the 18th century. It was trudled around the countryside to the village green, and the showman would say, walk up, walk up, pay a penny to see the wonders inside. And this, presumably, is where we get our expression, a penny to see the peep show. Yes, quite probably. Now, when the showman wanted to change his scene, he had a series of strings at the back, which he went round and pulled. John, that was marvellous. Can we see how you managed to change that scenery? Yes, we we'll know from the top of the box. And there's the flat in position. Now if we change it, the land hook it, and let them drop down to the bottom. What was the source of illumination in those days? Well, we've got these little candle sconces running through between each scenic flat, which I've converted to electricity. They had a candle in originally. And the smoke used to come up through these little funnels and out of the holes at the top. The museum is one of the most comprehensive of its kind in the world, and certainly there's nothing like it elsewhere in Britain. What is especially intriguing about it is the way in which the collection has been arranged so that one can see the link between early optical toys and their development through the centuries into the modern cinematograph. This is a section on panoramas. Here we've got 
the early form of panning shot only in paper panoramas, some of which date right back to the Bayer tapestry, of course. And they, of course, are all hand drawn and printed, are they? Well, this one in the centre here is printed from wood blocks. Each section is separately printed and pasted together to make a long panorama. I see. The word pan in, in, in modern terms is just short for panorama, is it? Yes, that's right. It's derived from the old panorama. And how did people use these? Well, the paper ones would be used at home, either spread out on the table or slowly unrolled. What's that extraordinary looking drawing, John? This is an anamorphic drawing. If you place a cylindrical mirror in the circle indicated, you will see the reflection free from distortion. It's put in boots. And you've got some others there? Yes, this rather peculiar looking gentleman with the fat tummy turns out to be a soldier. A soldier of the Queen, no doubt. Yes, probably. And you've got one more there. Very strange looking thing. Yes, what is this one? This is a monk smoking his pipe. Now, these were just a, a child's toy, were they? Yes, they were just exercises in perspective and distortions. And they're called anamorphoses, and nowadays, of course, there's a derivation of that in the modern cinema. Yes, with cinemascope, you've got the anamorphic lens, which compresses the image, then blows it out on the wide screen, which is a similar type of thing to what I've been showing you here with these anamorphic pictures. John, this is obviously something that's much more discernibly to do with the antecedents of the cinema, magic lanterns. These yes. are very old ones, aren't they? Yes, this is where it all began, really, because the projector, the film projector, is derived from the old magic lantern. Here we have one of about 1800, an oil lamp. Now, presumably, brightness of illumination was a tremendous problem. How do, how, what sort of things did they use, and how did they overcome it? Well, until M. A. Argan invented his lamp, lamps were very dim, and you had to bring your lantern very close to the screen. Therefore, your audience were tending to sit behind the projectionist. Here we come to the more modern optical magic lantern, most of them not dated to the latter part of the 19th century. John, these really are splendid objects, all that mahogany and brass. Yes, the magic lantern has advanced a considerable stage since those others we were looking at just now. They've become real optical instruments at this time, at the latter part of the 19th century. How were they illuminated? Well, the one in the background you can see is fitted with a limelight jet. The limelight? Now that's a name to conjure with. What was limelight exactly? Okay. Limelight was oxygen and hydrogen under pressure, which came out of a little jet onto a cylinder of lime, which became white hot after you let the gas, and gave off a very bright light, which was used in the theatre and that's where we get our term from, in the limelight, because it was the spotlight used to pick out the artist on the stage. Oh yes, of course. And presumably this was a tremendous breakthrough. For the first time, they could get clear, sharp, bright pictures. Yes, this is a fine example of a mahogany magic lantern made in about 1865. You can see it's fitted with a limelight jet. And instead of the hydrogen supply coming from a cylinder or a gas bag, it's connected up here to the gas bracket of the house. So that's exactly like we nowadays would plug in a 13 amp socket to get something. Yes, only that you see you're using the coal gas in lieu of the hydrogen. John, that looks an interesting device. What's that for? It's a pair of dissolving view lanterns for dissolving one scene into another. In this lantern, you would put a, 
a lantern slide showing a summer landscape. And in this one, the same scene only painted in the form of a winter scene. So that prefer showed the summer scene first and you gradually dissolved it into the winter scene. So I see the light is being cut off from one projector and being allowed to come through the other one. Yes. And they used to do some other pretty elaborate effects too, didn't they? Can you tell me about some of those? Yes. Yeah. For instance, you might have a, a seascape in here with a little boat tossing wildly on the sea, which you would do by moving the lever up and down. And at the same time, in this lantern, you would have a, a lightning effect. And you'd keep flashing it on the screen, and the tempest would you know, get more severe. You'd be turning and twisting and flashing. It was just rather an exciting and the exhibition. Loved it, I yes. John, these look fascinating. These are sort of moving lantern slides, are they? Yes, they were projected in the magic lantern. The Punch and Dog Toby. What's that one? That's uh, an acrobatic monkey. And two geese tugging at a worm. And down here we have the orator, who's ranting away with all his grimaces. Now, who used to show these magic lantern slides? Well, lantern entertainments were very common in Victorian times. They were shown in the village hall with a wide variety of moving slides like this. Presumably, can we just see the uh, orator again? Presumably, yeah. uh, he, he, something like that would give a great deal of amusement, would it? Yes, this would be considered extremely funny. You can get many different attitudes with it. It's a rather clever slide. And completely mechanically operated. Yes, it's just two pieces of glass sliding in front of each other with the little brass sheeting fixed to a point on each. It shows absolutely, doesn't it, how intense the desire was to create some movement. Yes, indeed. The bridge between those elaborate but essentially mechanical methods of achieving some rudimentary form of movement is shown in the persistence of vision display. As any school person knows, persistence of vision is the bit whereby an image is retained by the eye, the human eye at any rate, for a split second after it's been seen, a phenomena for which we must all be duly grateful, for without it there'd be no cinema and even television would be impossible. The early Victorians were the first to really exploit this principle, both in earnest and in fun, with a whole host of optical toys and experiments. John, this really was the breakthrough, wasn't it? The realisation that a series of similar pictures could make an illusion of movement. Yes, exactly. Can, can you describe I, some of the things in this? The first practical application was the thermotrope, invented by Dr. Paris in 1825. On one side you had a birdcage, for example, and the other side a bird. And when you twiddled it, the two images were retained on the retina of the eye, so you saw the bird inside the cage. And it's that principle on which the modern cinema is based. John, there's some really marvellous looking gadgets here. What's that one that looks like a model steam engine? Uh, this is the projecting fenacistico. It projects a series of pictures on a disc. And you've got an oil lamp here, and your lens there, and your, the pictures go around here as you turn the handle at the rear. And what sort of effect did that get? It was something similar to uh, an, an animated cartoon. It was projected on a screen, and you saw the images moving rather jerkily, I'm afraid. That's an interesting looking object, John, uh, with, with a, a winding key in it. Yes, it's the praxinoscope of Enval Renault, fitted with a clockwork motor under the base. We wind it up with the key, and then release the catch and set it in motion. I see, it's three boys playing leapfrog. Yeah. It, there's a very good degree of movement in that, isn't there? Yes, it's extraordinarily well done. 
Now this really was the precursor to that magic moment when somebody found out that if you took a whole lot of separate photographs on a strip of film, you really got proper movement. Yes, this, this is the idea before it's linked with photography. The, these were actually hand drawings, weren't they? Yes. A separate one. Yes, that's right. And how many would be in a machine like this? Twelve. It really is beautiful. Now, you've got another one of these downstairs in the foyer. Maybe we could take a look at that. Yes, it's exactly the same. And I've fitted it onto an electric motor downstairs. And as I set it in motion, you, you can see the figure moving in the mirror. Now, John, presumably this is another one of those Victorian optical toys. Yes, this is the zoetrope or Wheel of Life, invented by W.G. Horn of Bristol in 1833. There's a paper band inside with a series of figures drawn in phases of motion, so that when you view it through the slots, it appears animated. Quite properly, the museum has not ignored those milestones of cinema culture which once festooned every seaside pier and amusement arcade in the land, the what the butler saw machines. Now converted to take one new penny, these forerunners of the blue movie industry are still enormously popular with the museum's visitors. This is the famous mutoscope, originally invented by Herman Kessler in 1895 in the United States of America. And what's their principle? How do they work? Well, it's a reel of cards that flip over as you turn the handle, giving the illusion of movement. Seems a great shame that a generation is growing up, uh, you know, who won't be able to see these, except maybe at this museum, because they've taken them off all the piers and things, haven't they? Yes, they have, unfortunately. Why do you suppose that is? Well, I think it was trouble adapting them to the new coinage, but I've adapted all these to the new penny. Well, in that case, can you put a new penny in for us? And, yes, and come certainly. Out a now, on each card, there's a, a, a photograph print, isn't it? Now, this is a sort of the principle of the cinema today. Yeah, it was taken from a, a silly film printed onto a card. John, how did you come to start this museum? Well, we had been collecting for a number of years before we opened the museum. We thought it would be a good idea to show what we had to the public rather than keep it stored up privately. Um, where do you find your various objects? Oh, we've searched everywhere. In the flea markets, old junk shops, antique shops, anywhere. Or you get to hear of something, you know, and you beetle along there to see what they've got. Do you find you have to buy most of your stuff, or do people give you things? Well, the majority of it is bought, but we, we have had one or two nice gifts. Down the stairs, and appropriately enough past a little shrine dedicated to the man most credited with its invention, is the nub of the museum, the cinematography section. This contains some very fine examples of early film cameras and projectors. John, out of all these, which is the very earliest camera? It's this one shown here. It's a combined cinematograph camera and projector made by Bunsley and Contin Souza in Paris in 1896. And so that could either take films or project them? Yes, exactly. And what's that extraordinary looking mahogany this, object? Up this above? is lovely. This is a Baxter Ray camera, 35mm cinematograph camera. And incidentally, this was the camera that first went to Japan. It, it, one can say it established their cinema industry. Can we have a look at some of these uh, ones in this other case? Yes. Here's the Williamson 35mm cine camera. What sort of date's that? That's about 1910. And Alfred Darling, another one. This was a very famous English camera of about 1910. Now down there just by you that says Edison Projecting Kinetoscope. Yes, that's... was 1897. Now what sort of films would they project on that, that early? Well, Ordinary standard 35mm films. What sort of length would they be? 
Oh, the length was only about 40 odd feet. 40 feet, now that's in, in, but the speed of those days, that would be about 50 seconds, would it? Yes, more or less. What sort of scenes would they show? Well, you'd have just simple actualities. Um, obviously some more early projection machinery. Yes, a number two Empire cinematograph 35 millimeter projector. Still in working order, yes. I see. An English manufacturer. And here we have a German Erneman Mark I of about 1920. And all these still hand cranked. Yes. Makes one think of the operators turning away for hours on yes. end. And what's that splendid brute down below? Oh, this is a J wrench. Had a special movement worked by ratchet and pawl arrangement. Very complicated. I think system. this would be a good moment to maybe have a look at another one of those films that people would see projected on just such a machine. Well, John, I see from that programme up there that the new moving pictures got the Royal Seal of Approval in 1897. Yes, this was a Royal Command film performance. And you see here a souvenir programme printed on silk. Then down here I see there's some of the apparatus which is used for producing films. These accessories are particularly scarce. No one seemed to have kept them. They were thrown away. They're very hard to find. This is a Splicer of about 1910, contemporary with the cameras we've just been looking at. And then behind it? A film measurer, 1896. This measures up to only 100 feet because of the short lengths in use in those days. I see, they never thought it would be necessary to measure more than 100 feet at any no. one time. Okay. John, to me, in a way, this is the piece de resistance, uh, a, a film cleaning machine of 1910. I'm surprised that there was enough film around in 1910 to warrant cleaning. Well, in those days, exhibitors had to buy their film at so much a foot. So it was essential that they had their film in good condition as long as possible. Otherwise, they would have to buy another copy. There was no such thing as renters in those days. It's rather Heath Robinson looking thing, but it did its job, I suppose, with all the chamois leathers polishing and drying after the film had passed through the benzene bath. John, this is presumably the most modern bit of apparatus you've got in the museum. Yes, this is a 35mm cinema projector manufactured by L. Cam in 1918. If you wanted to project lantern slides, what you did was to slide the projection mechanism across, and then you project it through this second objective here. And what sort of films were cinema audiences paying to go and see during the First World War? Well, at the date of this projector, you'd be showing D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation and Tolerance, and of course, the Max Sennett comedies such as this one, Tin Lizzie's.
This remarkable collection does contain just about everything that's been tried for making pictures move, from those animated silhouettes which were probably amusing Chinese audiences when we British were still wearing woad and sacrificing maidens at Stonehenge, to the modern wonder of Cinerama. Although by chance the museum is situated in a popular seaside resort and visited by thousands of holidaymakers every year, it is also a serious and valuable attempt to preserve the nuts and bolts of an industry that has influenced the hearts and the minds of countless millions throughout the world. It's the industrial archaeology of the Dream Factory.